television highlights of the news of yesteryear. of the sit-down strike. It's January 1937, and idle Flint, Michigan auto workers have occupied this truck plant for six days. Sitting doesn't pay. Friends and relatives are allowed to visit at specified times, but in the main, they're outside looking in. Employers can go hang, and some do, but just in effigy. Strikers occupy eight factories now, and a Genesee County deputy sheriff reads court order for evacuation. But the workers sit. The strike drags on. Days pass. Tension grows. Outbreak of violence is imminent. Workers prepare to oppose National Guard guns with this ammunition of their own. Pickets 20,000 strong join the locked-in workers' cause. Threats of violence are forgotten as strikers cheer their sympathizers and word comes that negotiations for settlement are underway. But peace talk lasts a scant five minutes. Nothing accomplished. As sympathizers march, Michigan's Governor Frank Murphy goes to Washington, but days of conferences net the same result, failure. Strike by sit-down spreads. In Detroit, hotels are hit. Again, threats of violence. Again, the law stands by in readiness. Again, neither side accepts compromise. All's well with the sitting workers, though. Inside, they don't have a thing to worry about but getting paid. But who wants pay for this? The hotel is all theirs, lock, stock, and kitchen. While arbitrators, hotel owners, and guests are in a stew, striking busboys and bellhops help themselves to a turkey dinner. Hotel guest explorer Osa Johnson gets a lift in the arms of the law as sitting strikers bring service to a standstill. Songstress Ethel Chute gets nowhere trying to enter a strike-bound hotel. Turned away, she retaliates by going on a sit-down strike of her own. Strike by sit-down spreads to packing plants, but this time police take over. Court orders demand the plant be evacuated, and the law goes in to force truck workers out. siege of sitting over, workers under arrest are escorted from shutdown plants and hauled away in one of the longest lines of Black Mariah's man has ever seen. In the heart of Detroit, the 17th day of the strike, workers and sympathizers mass to demand action or arbitration. The sit-down is costing employers and employees a million dollars a day. Then strike leader Homer Martin appears. The cheers are for his promise of sure victory, for it's that or nothing. Workers will sit down till employers give up. A sit down both sides are glad to see. John L. Lewis and Walter P. Chrysler meet with Governor Murphy. And that handshake means the strike that shook a nation is over. It's now February 11th, and a sit down strike of over 40 days is at an end. After six weeks of stoppage, workers will again turn the wheels of industry. After six long weeks of idleness, it's home today and back to work tomorrow. The champion feeds his chicks. It's the middle 1920s and Jim Jeffries, king of prize fighters, from 1899 to 1906, is a prize farmer. On his Burbank, California ranch, Jeffries keeps active. Jim Corbett, first champion to fight with gloves, pays his pal Jeffries a friendly call. The talk is of old times and fights. Gentleman Jim Corbett topped all heavyweights from 1892 to 97, lost to Bob Fitzsimmons. Jeffries ran out of opponents, abandoned the title. Yesterday's newsreel presents the two pugilists who even to this day are considered among the greatest prize fighters of all time. Jim Jeffries works while pal Jim Corbett walks. We're in London.
London in the early 1900s, and there are as many horses as Henry's on good old Piccadilly. But horse-drawn vehicles are on the way up. And in 1916, the last one made its final trip. It's few steeds among many motors now, as London bids farewell to horse-drawn vehicles for now and forever. Oliver Wendell Holmes in 1930, then oldest member of the U.S. Supreme Court, poses on his way to see President Herbert Hoover. At the White House, here he is with Chief Justice Hughes. Almost 90, the barrister from Boston was still making American history the American way. The mistress of sophisticated slapstick, B. Lilly, in 1928. B proves you can eat your apple and have it too. See what I mean? Bravo, B. Rich man's son drops money for music. Son of banker Otto Kahn, Roger Wolf Kahn, leads his own orchestra. It's the early 1930s, and this young disciple of George Gershwin is big with a baton. This beats banking, he says, and Roger not only made music, but music made Roger. $30,000 a year. a dirigible. The crew of the British R-101 gets set for a first and final flight, destination disaster. Among the doomed is British Air Minister Thompson Center. In Cardington, England, 1930, most of these men have a date with death. But in the elevator up the mooring mast, there's no hint of the Holocaust to come. From mast to ship, the crossing spans into another world. The R-101 is off on its maiden journey. First stop on the schedule, Italy. But fate is flying too. Beauvais, France, next morning. This was the pride of Britain's Air Force, the world's mightiest aircraft. Now a charred mass of metal and motors. In the torn and twisted wreckage, 47 dead. Stunned British officers who inspect the remains search for the cause of disaster that flung the Queen of Britain's Air Force from the skies and sent nearly half a hundred of her crew on the long last voyage. There's not a Dodger on base, but the scene is Brooklyn. The event, a shoe fashion show in 1920. Them bums never put on a show like this. Bless her pointed little toes and her elegant brocade evening slippers. Guess who, Clementine or Cinderella, in these long vamped walking shoes? Even Grable couldn't be so able in heavy black stockings. Any relationship to the actual shape of the human foot was strictly coincidental. Back in 1920, Brooklyn produced 15 million pairs of high fashion footwear like this combination spat style. Waistlines were even longer than toe lines. Definitely 1920 fashions were not true to form. Square toes and instep straps are not too different from recent footwear fashions. Brooklyn leaves footprints on the sands of time. <laughs> The twice-told tale of Tempelhof, Berlin, Germany, 1925. Tempelhof Airdrome is the world's finest, the world's most lavish airport, too. By far the busiest in Europe, with 9,000 arrivals and departures, soon to zoom to 20 times that number. A mile wide, two miles long, it was world's biggest and aviation's best. The hub of daily flights to Paris, Prague, London, Luxembourg, Madrid, Moscow, Constantinople, Copenhagen, and thence to the far corners of the earth. This was Tempelhof, titan of airdromes in 1925. Nineteen forty-nine. Traffic at Tempelhof is different. German sea planes of the U.S. Air Force bringing food to the starving population of Berlin, clothing against the cold of winter, coal for empty and idle stoves and furnaces. 
giant temple hulk has to be enlarged for the heavily laden giants of the airlift. In five months, 93 million tons of food and fuel is unloaded on Tempelhof airstrips for a grateful people. In 1925, a lavish airdrome. In 1949, a greater Tempelhof is the lifeline between a world and a nation. September 1928. Vincent Richards, right at Forest Hills, New York, is about to hand Czech champ Carl Kozalu first defeat in nine years. Kozalu serving in first national tournament for pros. Richards' flawless backhand checks the sharp smashes of the Czech. Fourth and final set, match point. Kozalu returns the American smash. Richards' forecourt starts the cross-court fire. And then Richards' forehand sends the ball out of Kozalu's reach. The winner, Vincent Richards, top pro of the professionals. They're off and away in the 1934 running of the Hamiltonian, Goshen, New York. It's the fourth and final heat, with victories already gathered by Princess Pat, Lord Jim, and Musseltone. Trotting's highest stakes go to the winner of this classic. Far turn into the home stretch. Leading is Lord Jim, second muscle tone, driving hard but hopelessly to close the gap. But driver H.M. Farshall won't be caught. Ninth winner of the Hamiltonian is Lord Jim. 35,000 cheers, the champ of trotters walks to the winner's circle. Wearing a wreath of roses, Lord Jim is in clover from now on. <laughs> <laughs> 